Welcome to The Green Interview. My guest today is Elizabeth May, leader of the Green Party and a lifelong activist, a lawyer, um, a distinguished lawyer who is, uh, has a chair at Dalhousie University named for her, the author of seven books, for 17 years the executive director of the Sierra Club of Canada, and now the leader of the Green Party. Elizabeth, welcome to The Green Interview. Thanks, Don. Great to be here. Great pleasure to have you here, too. I was thinking as I, as I uh, was preparing for this that over the years, um, if I had to characterize the, the kind of style you've had, I would have said it was a lovely blend of outrage and optimism. <laughs> That's very good. Thanks. I like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually outraged about something, and I'm. But my brother says my motto is fight, 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 but be nice. I think that's very <laughs> accurate too. So something around, that. and we've known each other a very long time. We have indeed. For those who are watching this, I think we first met through Farley Mowat, probably sometime in the 70s. I'm trying to remember. I, th I think it goes back to the uh, to the Budworm battles. Yeah. And uh, when we were both on the same side of that one, I didn't want the, our, our beloved Cape Breton Island sprayed with uh, poison. You didn't either. And, uh, and we was, won. And we won. We won. But you put in a tremendous effort on that and actually suffered later for, from the spraying. You lost, the family lost your house. Well, that was fighting, not the Budworm spraying. That was the, um, I, I call these campaigns basically in, Star Wars themes, you know, you have the, the, the first one, Star Wars, were the good guys, and the second one was the Empire Strikes Back, and, and that was when the pulp ind paper industry in Nova Scotia decided to demand spraying of Agent Orange. And that was when we were forced into court because they didn't give us time to actually fight through the, you know, non-litigious ways of petitions and appeals and concerts and pleadings and all the things you do to get politicians to change their minds. The difference was phase one of the Budworm campaign was convincing the government of Premier Gerald Regan. Phase two was John Buchanan. And the current, he's currently an MP for the Digby area, um, who actually, Greg Kerr, was the Minister of Environment who approved Agent Orange spraying in Nova Scotia and told me basically, uh, I, you know, if you want to stop us, you'll have to go to court. And so that was a very punishing experience, although the court case and the injunctions that we got on a temporary basis were enough to hold off the Agent Orange spraying until the chemicals were no longer available by regulatory action in the United States, not by the Canadian government, which was benignly, uh, absolutely uh, prepared to accept that Agent Orange was fine uh, as governments elsewhere around the world banned it. And, uh, it sounds like our own dear place. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, and uh, at that same, that, by the time that actually happened though, a way of looking at that battle is that you kind of held the thing off, mm -hmm. uh, you and, and a few others, but held that off until the point where the ban took place and then, it be, then, then, then you'd want it permanently, but won it permanently almost by accident, but just by de the delay. Well, sometimes delay, you know, delay is your friend when, as one of my friends, Bristol Foster out in British Columbia, is a great biologist and activist. He says, you know, and this is going to sound very pessimistic. He said, you know, in the environmental movement, every victory is temporary and only the defeats are permanent. So if you try to protect an ancient temperate rainforest, as we were when I first got to know Bristol, was the, the fight to protect the southern third of the Queen Charlotte Islands archipelago, which is now Guayahannas National Park. And it is true, if you lose it, that's permanent. But often, just holding off something horrible from happening is enough. Buying time is a good thing to do. Uh, and that, it, that does require optimism, because some people can say, well, you did all of that and you still lost the court case. But the uh, temporary injunction that we got in the summer of 1982 for Mr. Justice Denny Burchell, God bless his soul, anyway, he gave us a temporary injunction which meant that we went through a court case, but it kept the pulp company from spraying until the court case was over. And that was two spray seasons later. And of course, Justice Merlin Nunn ruled that uh, Agent Orange wasn't dangerous, wasn't dangerous in Vietnam, wasn't dangerous anywhere in the world. It was a, a stunning court decision. But as it happened, by then, the uh, US Department of Environmental Protection Agency and Dow Chemical had reached an agreement that prevented Dow Chemical from exporting 245T to other countries, which was, you know, it was, it was a, a Pyrrhic victory for the pulp company. It wasn't the kind but of... a real victory it, it, for it, you, right? It was a victory in that we held off the spring. It was financially punishing, and my family lost our land, and it was, it, it was a very hard 
court loss because of the punitive nature of the decision in terms of going after us for costs and damages. But all that said, we did keep Eastern Nova Scotia from being one of the last places uh, in, in the world to be sprayed with, with Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I have the impression, I want to quote, I want to quote you something from Elizabeth May. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what path is the best way to get global agreements to stop greenhouse gases from rising by two, 2015? Because if we don't do that one thing, nothing else matters. Seems to me that this is the voice of somebody whose optimism is getting a bit tempered at this point. Is that My correct? optimism is being tested severely. I mean, I first started working on the issue of global warming, the climate crisis. Back in 1986, I happened to have been, now this was bizarre given my background as a grassroots activist, that I was asked to join the political staff of the Federal Minister of Environment in the Mulroney years. I mean, it was... Ex yeah, what are the odds of that? Yeah, you can't plan for a thing like that because it's so unlikely. But it was a great experience. And I, one of the things, that, you know, going there, based, having a history of fighting, uh, as we've talked about, the forest spray issues, um, nuclear power, Climate change was not one of the issues that I even knew about very much. I'd worked on acid rain, few aware of ozone depletion, but I was being given the top-notch scientific briefings because I attended all the sessions that my boss did with departmental officials. And the briefings on the science of climate change in 1986 were enough to scare the life out of me. And this was when we were still talking about there, there was never any doubt in the scientists' advice in terms of the fact that you add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, you're destabilizing global climate. None of this was ever in any kind of doubt. But I can remember them saying by 2030 we could see the glaciers in retreat. Oh my God, the glaciers have been in retreat for the last decade. They're in retreat in the Rockies, the Himalayas, the Andes. The Drake glaciers are in retreat globally. And the ice cap melting, this is all much faster than the scientists yes. had been saying back in 86. And it, so the science gets more and more robust, the warnings get clearer, and governments are still playing this game of, oh, well, maybe next time. Or, you know, there's only so much we can do without harming our economy. And at least the Canadian government, and now you have, you know, Stephen Harper is prime minister. I don't know how many Canadians know this, but I cannot find any evidence that he's received a single scientific briefing as prime minister of this country on the climate crisis. I know most of the uh, atmospheric chemical scientists in the government of Canada, most of those in academe, most of them who are part of the intergovernmental panel on climate change who are Canadians, and nobody knows of any time that he's been properly briefed. So I don't think he believes that this is real. So here we are looking at uh, a window that's closing. And the window that's closing is closing on our opportunity to make a transition away from fossil fuels, to do it in a way that's beneficial for society, and to do it sufficiently quickly and aggressively that we can avoid uh, the worst case scenarios of the climate crisis. We can no longer avoid the fact that we've changed the atmosphere. We've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere. We're in a period of climatic disruption. We're going to be facing, you know, if you turn on the nightly news, it may have dawned on people that it didn't used to be the case that every night brought a new natural disaster story, you know, it looks like a sci-fi adventure. It's, if it's the forest fires of brush fires in Australia or forest fires in California or shrinking Arctic ice or unprecedented flooding. This is the world as, as we have made it and it's going to continue in this way for some considerable time. And the, the, the challenge to optimism is we've got a limited amount of time to make these agreements work that are multilateral, that are international. And uh, that, that's really a challenge. It's if you say, as I believe, the Copenhagen negotiations this December are really our last good chance, uh, then people say, well, what happens if they don't succeed? What do you say next? Well, this isn't a messaging story. This isn't some <laughs> tactic. This is looking at the science, looking at rising atmospheric levels of, of carbon dioxide, and knowing that to avoid runaway global warming, we need to ensure that we stop the rise in greenhouse gases no later than 2016. And I'm not saying how fast you have to bring them down, there, but we've got to stop the increase yeah. by 2016. So that's what the scientists are telling us. Some say we've already passed the point of no return. Some say, you know, you're being overly negative, but, but there are very, very few scientists 
who will disagree with some cold, hard realities, we've got to stop the increase by about 2016. So a negotiating session in 2009, given the lag times for ratification and turning around an economy, uh, we're playing right up against, uh, we're down to the wire, really, on this issue. And I'm still optimistic, but uh, there's not a lot of room, there's no room for delay and for procrastination of any kind. Mm -hmm. This really has become almost the environmental movement, the global warming issue. Right? It's, it, it, there used to be a whole bunch of other things mm -hmm. that we were concerned about, you know, the, the water, the, uh, the air, the, well, the air obviously is part of this, but there were all kinds of other issues. And it seems to me that, that the, uh, the horrific reality of, uh, of the prospects that are opened up by climate change have just dwarfed everything else on the environmental side. Well, I think there still are, and I know there still are, lots of critical environmental issues. There sure. are issues around, around how much are we poisoning ourselves with toxic chemicals. There's issues around protecting. I mean, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the major reason for species loss and, and the issue of, of, and this is a huge environmental issue, is loss of biological diversity through extinction crisis. But the number one driver for that is climate crisis. So why is the polar bear endangered? Because the ice is melting. Um, but I don't think, and this may sound counterintuitive what I'm going to say, I don't think we can succeed in addressing the climate crisis until governments no longer think of it as an environmental issue at all. When it's a security issue, and now the Obama administration is taking up some of the studies that were done actually by the U.S. Department of Defense, the Pentagon did studies in the Bush administration that Bush didn't want to see, but to basically say, uh, the impacts of the climate crisis dwarf terrorism as a security concern. If you want to pay attention to what happens to the planet and to the world's peoples and to geopolitical instability, and you want to look for the scariest scenarios that are out there, short of nuclear war, they all surround ignoring the climate crisis till we pass those points of no return. And then there's very little we can do to hang on to civil human civilization. So when governments get that, when they see the economic advantage, in making the shift away from fossil fuels. And a lot of governments are increasingly seeing that. So the European Union governments, um, China, by the way, just put $600 billion into green technology as a response to the recession to kickstart their economy. They didn't pick $600 billion in green technology because they want you know, to be concerned about the environment as a political issue. This isn't even a democracy, obviously. China's looking at cold, hard reality. If we don't make this shift, we don't make it. So yeah, as a species, yeah. we just don't make it. And the same is true in the economic sphere. If you look at Sir Nicholas Stern's, you know, uh, yeah. I thought really landmark report. Yeah. Which, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, here's for, for people watching this who don't know, I mean, Sir Nicholas Stern's report said if you, if you want to look at the economic costs of acting on the climate crisis, you ought to look at the economic costs of not acting. And they are horrific. So he, he pegged, you know, going through an economic analysis, and he's, after all, not a piker. He's the former senior economist to the World Bank. And he said, you're going to have $7 trillion worth of impact on the global economy. It makes what just happened with the subprime mortgages and the recession meltdown of September uh, 08. It looks like, you know, it's a Sunday school picnic compared to just the economic impacts of not acting appropriately to address the climate crisis. And we are, it is particularly painful to be uh, Canadian a country that used to be in the lead on the issue. It was back in, and it's not, it's not partisan or ideological on my part to note that it was Brian Mulroney's government that was globally uh, one of the leaders back in the, in the late 80s and at Rio up to the Rio or summit in 92. And now here we have a government that's not only not being, uh, not addressing the need in Canada to reduce emissions, globally our government acts as a saboteur. Yeah, we, we've become the bad guy. We are one of the worst. We are, we are bonding with other bad guys. We like mm -hmm. now working in international negotiations with Saudi Arabia. Um, we found some of the uh, breakaway former Soviet states that are prepared to work with us to try to undermine the European Union. Uh, our, pre our performance internationally with Harper as Prime Minister has been nothing less than shameful. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, it's, it's uh, the thought of him being Prime Minister still when we go into the Copenhagen negotiations, which are December 09, 
is, is really quite um, painful. Frankly, it's just painful. And I really hope that, uh, I think we're going to have a fall election. And if nothing else, I think that, that dynamic could change. Not that I have much or any reason to think that we're going to see great leadership from, uh, from the official opposition if it should become government, because Dion is not influencing their policies, and Mr. Ignatiev hasn't shown to be very concerned or committed to action on climate. But it will be a lot different to have people who can be reached, and, and Mr. Harper refused to be reached. Yeah. Are we getting here pretty much to what, I guess when you became leader of the Green Party, there was, this, there was a certain sense of inevitability about that. Um, and, and I guess my, my thought was, well, of course, you get to a certain point and, and what you can do from outside, what you can do by beating on the doors and doing mm -hmm. protests and so on and so forth, uh, there's a limit to what you can do about that sometime or some, at some point along the, uh, along the line. There's got to be action taken by people who are actually in parliament or in government or both um, uh, to actually act on these kinds of things. So I, I was in a certain sense surprised when you became leader of the Green Party, but in another sense it seemed to me like a kind of logical evolution. It may, you know, it's hard for me to judge, you know, my own history in that way. I, I would, I don't believe I would ever have gotten involved in politics if Stephen Harper hadn't succeeded in becoming Prime Minister. I mean, the chances of him being Prime Minister at the point he became leader of the Alliance Party, I, I mean, do you remember how all of us felt? We look at it and think, oh, well, the, lead, the Alliance Party can't form government. Yeah. And then the cannibalization of the Progressive Conservative Party. I mean, Margaret Atwood described it as the, as the body eater. The, the, was it, what it wasn't the body <laughs> eaters. The, the, the flesh eating disease. Well, it, yes, like it was, yeah. um, it was that wonder, it was that sci-fi movie, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yeah, 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 she, yeah. That's her metaphor, that the, the Progressive Conservative Party was, you know, basically, you know, the Alliance Party came along and swallowed them whole. And Margaret Atwood was a better metaphor than I am, but I, th I think she actually said they peeled off their skin and emerged trying to pretend they were still the Conservative Party, but being this entirely different animal that was really the Alliance Party. I didn't see that coming. And when I woke up after the January 06 election and realized, okay, now what do we do? I'm the executive director of an environmental organization. I've been able to influence and talk to every prime minister since Joe Clark. What are we going to do now? Because I know Stephen Harper, and I know that he is not going to listen. These are, in his mind, concerns for climate action, the environment, for that matter, a lot of social justice issues in healthcare, just things that are in the way. They are not his concerns, and he, will, and he is not the sort of person who governs by reaching out and asking loads of people and arriving at a consensus. That was Paul Martin style, that kind of bear pit session. Everybody would argue, everyone would say something. I mean, he used to invite NGOs in. Paul Martin did uh, on issues of third world debt. A whole bunch of us came in and argued with him. And he said, okay, you prove to me Canadians want action on third world debt, I'll do something. We proved it and he did. You know, that was a different kind of dynamic. It was very clear when Stephen Harper was a, became our Prime Minister, because I refuse to use the terms, I try very hard to check myself. Based on the research I did for my new book, I realized the mistake we make by talking about Stephen Harper winning an election or anyone mm. being elected Prime Minister, because it plays into the notion that our system of government is anything like that in the United States. Barack Obama was elected President. Voters in the US go into a voting booth and they, they yep. punch a button, they do whatever it is electronically, but they pick Barack Obama to be president. Canadians go into a, a, a cardboard space, we take a pencil, and we pick our MP. That's what we do. That's how parliamentary democracy works. So in any case, uh, seeing Stephen Harper become our prime minister, I realized that everything I worked on for over 30 years was at risk, and there was no way to make the conventional relationship between a non-government organization, pressure groups, citizen outcry, those things weren't going to work anymore, yeah. which is why I, I had really decided I was never going into politics. I decided it well before <laughs> going into politics. And, no, but and you did before. You, know, you, you, you remember the small briefly, party. That yeah, you, yes, briefly. That. But I was, yeah, the small party venture was in 1980, yeah. and my idea was I wanted to see environment and nuclear issues talked about in the election campaign. But our actual initial plan was to, was to sh 
just remove our names from the ballot before the actual vote. So what we wanted to do was influence the debate. I wasn't really thinking for a minute that we were creating a new political party. Now, other people who became involved in the and small party, we took the name small party because we didn't have time to write a platform. We thought we all agreed there are about 12 of us in six provinces. I said, okay, we'll use E.F. Schumacher's book, yeah. small, at, small is Beautiful, as our template because it's brilliant stuff and it makes sense and it's, it's more than one book. It's a whole philosophy of appropriate technology. I said, okay, that'll work for us. I wasn't thinking that I was forming a new no, political I'm, party, but it's true. I, went in, I did I'm, run against Alan McEachin in 1980, but I didn't expect to win. I have expected to win since in a number of elections well, I'm where I came close. I'm being a little bit of a bad boy, but, yeah. uh, but, there, is a, but there, is a, there is a natural progression, it seems to me, that, that, that at yeah. some, some point, either you've got to, to have people in Parliament that, that you know can pick up the ball and run with it, or somebody that, like yourself, has to get in there and do that. Yeah, this, just, it, I guess it, ultimately it, the government has to move. Yes, and I had been tempted over the years. I'd been asked by uh, virtually all the major political parties in this country to run for them at different times and felt, no, I'm making a bigger difference here where I am. Um, my friend Maud Barlow and I used to talk about it because regularly as election fever would pick up, she'd get a call from someone, and we'd both get calls from Jack Layton and Paul Martin. And we'd both talk about it and say, well, I don't know, what do you think? I know. We'd always conclude that, we're, that what we were doing with our, with our non-government organization approach was the most effective things we could do with our lives. And I don't know that I would have personally changed if the political context in Canada hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. But given mm -hmm. that, there's no question, we desperately need green voices in the House of Commons because I think now it's the only way to address some very serious uh, problems that are impoverishing the democratic discourse in Canada that are making politics uh, abusive, that create this really toxic atmosphere on Parliament Hill. So to fix that, I think we need a complete sea change and we need to say to all the old line parties, look, the public doesn't want you behaving like this anymore. And that's why the Greens are getting these votes and that's why Greens are in the House of Commons. And once we're in the House of Commons, and once I'm there, my, my plan is to make sure that we do politics so very differently that the other parties will have to shift away from some of the more destructive things that have become commonplace in the last few years. I want to just at this point put in a plug for this book, which is Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's current book, um, Losing Confidence, Power, Politics, and the Crisis in Canadian Democracy. Because one of the things that striking, struck me as I was reading the book was, I thought, you know, you really didn't go into this to change the way we do politics. You went into it to change what politics does in terms of environment. Mm -hmm. um, but your experience has been a, a, a relatively bitter one. And I think you've, you have more than anybody, any, any other book that I've read recently anyway, you have really pinpointed a whole bunch of things that have gone off the rails uh, yeah. in, in Canadian politics, you know, gradually over a period of years, but quite acutely in recent years. Well, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it because uh, the book for I me didn't say was. I enjoy it. Oh. I think it's true. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 gra I'm grateful for it, but it's not a fun <laughs> read in the sense that you get you, you read it and you think, oh, man, this is awful. This yeah, is really and, and most of what's in the book, some of it is personal reflections, but most of my evidence for a real crisis in our democracy comes from things that were published in newspapers, but my mm. sense of our experience, whether it's the combination of 24-hour news cycles and things that are in the news one second and by three hours later they're old news, I don't know what it is, the lack of capacity and the concentration of power in the conventional news media is a real problem. But the narrative is missing. So, for instance, I, I spend a lot of time in the book, a chapter on the RCMP. I mean, I think it's, it's absolutely scandalous that no one has required former Commissioner Zaccardelli to explain himself because it's clear his actions in 2005 for refreshing people's memories, putting out a press release that mentioned Ralph Goodale and said he was being investigated for, for some sort of a potentially criminal activity, which was absolute horse you know, swallow and was completely proven to be ridiculous. But in the middle of an election to do that changed the dynamic of that election and arguably uh, gave Mr. Harper his chance to form a minority government and no investigation ever? I mean, if the state police get involved in politics to that extent, you've got a crisis. But the narrative thread gets lost. Of course, lost. who would do it? Who would make that, uh, that um, investigation would have to be the very people who benefited from the misadventures yes. of the RCMP. Well, if yes, and then, then the question is, well, how 
democratic is your society if something like that goes by unexamined? Yes. Uh, why, you know, how healthy is a democracy when only 58% of people vote? And that's a really tough one. I spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. And I do see my role in politics in Canada, and I, I tried so hard in the last election campaign to just, through every media interview I did, through the, the speech I got to give for three minutes at the launch of the campaign, they went through all the leaders for a live TV feed, and all I was saying, I was just, you know, very nonpartisan. My speech was, please, Canadians, pay attention to this election. Don't just tune in to CNN and watch the, the amazing contest of McCain-Obama. This is our future, our democracy. We've got to get engaged here. It's, it's a hard one because so many Canadians are justifiably, I think, cynical about politics and distrustful of what they see and, and really quite disgusted with the excessive partisanship. So and now, yes, you're right, I, I went into politics in a sense to make sure the climate issue was addressed and we never have another election campaign such as the debates in 2005, 2006 where climate never came up as an issue to make sure that could never happen again. And in the process, I'm thinking, no, the larger role of Greens right now is not around any one issue or any set of issues. It's about reforming political culture to where it respects not only each other and other parties, but is respectful towards the voters so that people who elect an MP know that they've elected someone whose number one concern is to represent the people who've sent them to Parliament. Because in a representative democracy, that's the essence of it. It's not, it, it's, it's been quite corrupted by a couple of factors. Uh, the expanded power and clout of well-financed, well-organized, disciplined political parties, and by this cult of leadership that's allowed us to sort of Americanize the Canadian democratic process and throw in things to the mix that are really, really despicable, like using attack ads at all that has a deliberate effect of driving down voter turnout. So it's, there's a lot now that, um, in between my, my uh, outrage and optimism, a lot of that outrage now comes from what's happening to democracy in Canada. Yeah, and so now you're, you wind up with a, with a really difficult situation where you're there primarily about green issues, uh, and specifically with climate change. And at the same time, you have to deal with what's in a way, a much more minor issue, which is the question of Canadian democracy, in order to get at the larger issue. But there's no way to get at the larger issue if you don't solve the smaller one. That's right. right. And the, I don't think that democracy is ever a small issue. I think, you know, it, it was... Well, it is for, compared to survival. Well, yes, right? yes, but you can't... Sur yes, that's just it. I mean, I suppose we could imagine a world in which a despotic dictator delivered... Uh, you know, salvation from the climate crisis. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's without an effective functioning democracy, we can't deal with any of our crises. And of course, uh, one of the things I do like a lot about being leader of the Greens compared to being at Sierra Club is that although I have, you know, obviously I think climate change is the overwhelming, urgent, immediate challenge, I'm also quite engaged and passionate about issues that I never got to talk about when I was at Sierra Club, like our health care system, like our role in the world and militarism and, and working for conflict resolution and returning Canada to our tradition as a peacekeeper and not being increasingly, you know, sort of flexing our muscle about how, you know, northern sovereignty is all about more militarism. I don't think so. We're letting the ice disappear. That's, that's the biggest threat to sovereignty. Our, our, our territory is melting. That's, that's sovereignty. So there are a lot of issues and a lot of economic issues and job creation issues that are really important to me personally, that are important to the Green Party. But none of them can be addressed if democracy is sliding ever downward and farther from our reach, and particularly in terms of young people who decide at 18 they're not going to vote because there's a whole bunch of reasons given. Some is apathy, but I think a greater part of it is actually a, a conscious decision that they're disgusted by what they see and they don't want to participate. Well, the smell of politics these days is, is enough to drive you off. And, yeah. and it didn't used to reek like that. No. You know, that you, there's always been you know, ambition and chicanery and you know, deals made and stuff like that. But it, it's not the same. It, it doesn't have the same sort of real nasty quality that it does now. It may have had that at some long gone era. Uh, you know, yeah, you go back, you look at US politics and, and Tammany Hall. But in terms of our recent history, going back to Lester Pearson, 
going through all the politics in Canada that I've ever known, there was never a time where, like now in question period, it's really a new thing and too many Canadians think this is routine. Before an MP in the opposition benches can even ask their question, conservative MPs begin booing. Now this is outrageous. This is not, this is not acceptable. It should be ruled out of order by the speaker. It violates parliamentary rules. It violates parliamentary decorum. And it's, it's, it's essentially, a, one of my friends who's a liberal MP, um, Glenn Pearson, ha described it to the Toronto Star as basically abuse. The atmosphere in the House, he said, is, mm -hmm. it's, it's abusive. And um, when, when Ned Broadbent gave his final speech as a parliamentarian, he read aloud the UN uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that every human being has the right to be treated with dignity at all times. He said, how often have we done that in this place? Well, between when Ed made that speech and now, we've gone from the occasional taunt and heckling to nonstop abuse. Sexist taunts that do not get repeated by the media because they're off to the side. You hear them when you're there personally. You hear things said that just make you feel so livid and disgusted. And that's now routine. And that has to change because if people see that and feel disgusted by what goes on on Parliament Hill, that inevitably reduces the likelihood. Unfortunately, it should make you say, I want to go out and vote because I want to change this. I'm sick of watching that. I want to go out and vote. But when people feel it's not just a question of one party versus the other, but think that whole system turns yeah. me off. Yeah. That's when people are depressed, you know, <laughs> actually depressed, but you're actually <laughs> depressed voter turnout. Mm -hmm. So the individual is demoralized, depressed, and feels, and this is really dangerous in our, in our current society, consumer culture continually reinforces the notion that all you are is a consumer. Well, you mentioned that in the book, and you quoted Dr. Kenneth Melchin, who I gather is somebody you've been studying with, uh, about the spread of market theory into everyday life, and I thought that was a fascinating observation. He's very cool. He is a professor and an ethicist at St. Paul's University in Ottawa, where I study theology part-time, and he just made this point in a classroom uh, lecture that, you know, in previous cultures and societies, always elevated certain virtues. They weren't necessarily virtues attached to religious doctrine, but if you're going to live well together in a society, it's a good thing to identify that greed is a vice and caring and compassion and helping others is a virtue. And we've had that turned right on its head because of market theory and the adoption holus bolus of the notion that everyone operates to maximize the greatest gain for themselves. So we've actually accepted as if it's uh, an operative reality. It's not. It's, it's, it works for a market. If you're going to say, well, we want to project consumer demand, and we know that when something's scarcer, the price goes up, I mean, that's economic theory. And it belongs over there as economic theory. It's not. Uh, it doesn't even work there, though, because we're not <laughs> rational. It doesn't not, work. It doesn't well. work. I don't, you know, no, because anyway. there's tons of interference with the so-called market. But well, people have emotions, and the market theory doesn't take that into account. That's true. People have emotions. Market theory doesn't take that into account. And also market theory is perverted and distorted by activities that are called economics, which are actually gambling. So mm. a, a global mm. casino economy is not people, you know, if people are making a profit because they have a little cobbler shop and they make the very best shoes at the very best price and therefore people demand their shoes and will pay a little bit more for them. That's a real economy. The fake economy is when someone who's a financier with billions of dollars at play, decides to say, I'll bet your mortgages aren't going to fold against that other currency over there. And because when you start having an entirely speculative economy in which money is made out of nothing, then your, your market theory is out the window because you're, you're basically gambling. Yeah. And when you get caught, unfortunately, the financiers aren't the ones who, who lose the most. It's the cobbler with his little shop, try to sell the best shoes, who loses the most. So, yeah, but and, so, I, and I interrupted you. Yeah. I, mean, I kind of sent you off on market no, no, but theory, but Kenneth every now and again, but, I, 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 yeah. I you know. it's by Kenneth Melton's theory. Back to this is yeah. over this. Of what we've done is we've and politicians reinforce this. So we're habituated instead of being habituated to virtue, we're becoming habituated to vice. To where the economic system and a government will say to you, and a politician will say to you, you know, basically what they're thinking is, I know how to get that guy's vote. 
I just have to bribe him, because everybody's selfish and greedy and venal, and therefore I know how to get their vote. And I think that's dead wrong. I think, well, all of us are a little selfish or we wouldn't be human, and all of us are a bit greedy or we wouldn't be human. But we're also, in large measure, completely willing to sacrifice things for others. And, and willing it in, in, in a nanosecond to say, sure, I'd rather have that tax be what it is if I know that every single one of my neighbors, and by the way, me as well, are going to be protected from catastrophic events by a decent health care system. Uh, that's something that Canadians have always embraced. And it goes quite against the grain of this theory that we're all out for ourselves. That's not what Canadian society what community has ever been about in this country. And it's, it's, it's good to remind ourselves of that, but it's also important to reject out of hand the notion that what makes people tick is greed. It's, uh, it's wrong-headed in the extreme. Your, your comment about the healthcare system is a really interesting one because I think any, any politician who wants to get his hands cut off starts to muck around with the healthcare system in any serious way and instantly hears about it. So, you know, you're absolutely right that that's a place where you can see very clearly that, you know, that uh, my personal well-being is, is not what I'm altogether about. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, there are lots of examples in Canada of, uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's been said we have more of a communitarian ethic than south of the border. I mean, if you, if you go back and read de Tocqueville, which is always fun to do, in terms of his observations of, of the U.S. as a nascent culture and just in its very beginnings, there was always much more focus on individualism than, you know, than what we have in Canada. And I, you know, I grew up in the States and moved to Canada. Really evident to me that there's, not to say that, that the U.S. is, is not capable of, of great and, and admirable things, but we do have more history in Canada of saying, it matters what we do. The common good matters. Community matters. And when we move away from that, I think, I think we put ourselves in some danger. We are, we are, we are two different countries, and, and Canadians often sort of tend to forget that, but we really are. We do have different histories and, to a large extent, different values. Yeah. Let me ask you a little bit about, um, uh, you are studying to be an Anglican priest. This is the slowly, very slowly. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. It became slower when I started to become leader of the Green Party. Well, absolutely, but but you know that that uh, that speaks very strongly to some of the themes that we've just been talking yeah. about. But one of the things, let me ask you, what seem to be some of the hard questions here, because it seems to me that part of the problem that we have in terms of of our relationship with nature comes from. Christian thought comes from the idea that we have dominion over mm -hmm. all the things that creep and fly and that, that famous passage in, in Genesis. Um, and I, I tend to think that, that one of the things that the religion does in this, in, in this context is to, is to give people a sense that, well, there is a kind of a backup there. there you know, Daddy will, in the last act, take care of us. And I'm not really sure that that's a helpful perception if we're going to try and deal with these things ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's, there's certainly there was a, um, a school of thought that Judeo-Christian tradition has given us this notion of humanity as top dog, peak of evolution, able to lay waste to anything. There's the flip side of that, which is becoming increasingly powerful and potent within um, both, you know, interreligious dialogue beyond Christianity, because the Genesis story is also shared with uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, and it's, in, it's a powerful myth. I mean, it is a myth. It's, it's, it's our creation myth. Every culture has its own creation myth. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, it turns out, uh, this is one reason I love studying theology. I actually got to do a word-by-word -word examination of Genesis with a scholar who, where we were going back to the original Hebrew. So I can assure you, it was a bad translation. Have dominion actually <laughs> means remove obstacles. I mean, basically, it was an agrarian vision, right, because it's a garden. So mm -hmm. we're not talking mm -hmm. wilderness. We've actually got a garden. We're already cultivating something. And it's sort of an adaptation, apparently, from a Babylonian creation myth. But anyway, we're given pretty clear instructions. You have everything you need. You'll want for nothing. Just don't take that fruit over there. That's all you have to do. So from the very beginning, humanity has shown a real disinclination to, to follow the rule book that came with the planet. But beyond that, when you what look at it. What a very good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at it, there's, there's um, the, um, the great theologian who just passed away, uh, Father Thomas Berry, he's the one who's come up with this, turning this, this tradition that to the extent it was ever true, that humanity had any kind of right to lay waste to the planet. 
he came up with the theory of, of creation theology and the discipline of creation theology. And it spread very rapidly because it makes so much sense, which is if God did create our entire world, at each stage of the Genesis story, there's a pause while the creator said, and it is good. It is good as it is, meaning it is sacred. I mean, we may not have any idea why we were put on this planet, but as people of faith, you can be pretty sure we weren't put here to destroy everything God made, especially since our own existence depends on a functioning biosphere. So the, the spread of, and there's a whole lot of really cool stuff going on in the world of cosmology. People like Brian Swim worked with Thomas Berry, talk about our existence on this planet as co-creators in an evolving universe so that we actually become not just approaching our, our, our natural world with the reverence that's required, recognizing that we need to live, survive, have an economy, use and, and uh, use the planet's resources, but that we have to operate within the limits and rules of a functioning biosphere. So it's, it's, it's actually created a whole powerful movement of people who are practicing whatever faith or religion, but who are doing so in a conscious quest for right relationship with the non-human living parts of this whole planet, other species, the biosphere, and recognizing that to get in right relationship with all of that is the only way to be in right relationship with ourselves and our creator. And uh, that's, that in itself is both a powerful theological message and a powerful political message. When you say right relationship, it, that's, that almost is Buddhist phrasing. Yes. <laughs> well, I, mean, I'm, I also consciously talk about interreligious dialogue. This new wave, and also it's, it's, um, it's not, uh, you know, as a practicing politician now, as a federal leader, I have to always say the Green Party is also composed of lots of people who are absolutely confident as atheists, agnostics. We're not a religious party. I have a religious tradition. And it, uh, people get very nervous about it because the only yeah. politicians lately who talk about being Christian are people who seem to want to be intolerant, um, say, you know, therefore, because I'm a Christian, I don't support equal marriage, or because I'm a Christian, I'm against abortion. That kind of, that people, kind of... People you wouldn't want to have to dinner. No, well, what it is, it's, I think it's important to actually address uh, religious issues from a political stance to, to also reassure people that there's a, there are a lot of scientists, including Albert Einstein, who believe they had religious inspiration, who are actually faithful people. And it's not, you know, when the only people who talk about religion are people like Sarah Palin or George Bush, you want to run for the hills as a Christian. You think, oh my. So on the other hand, if you are a Christian, it might be helpful for others to say, no, that's not actually how I see my faith. I see it in terms of a, a very strong edict to end poverty. Hmm. Jesus said that a lot. He never said a word against equal marriage. Not once. Yeah. So I think ending poverty is the goal. And in terms of protecting life on Earth to ensure that we take care of each other and that we have a livable biosphere, uh, that's also part of a quest that is embraced now by all the great religions of the world. That's really interesting. The interreligious dialogue is rapidly having its place in, by the way, climate negotiations. The World Council of Churches is there and always pressing for what the scientists tell us must be done. So it's a, it, there, there's a lot of very fertile thought and work at an analytical level being done in this um, ecology theology dialogue. One of the things that, that, that emerges from what you just said for me is, is, the, is the absolute crucial um, need for new thinking, for re, you know, for reevaluation in practically every sphere of human life. I mean, uh, you know, I'm a tottering old fossil, but uh, you know, when I was growing up, we really did have that sort of sense that the fish were inexhaustible, the forests were inexhaustible, there was no limit to the amount of ore in the in the crust yeah. of the earth, and so on. And and that's that's completely changed. I mean, we've, we've had to completely invert our understanding of that. 
And I guess to hear you talk about inverting the understanding of, of uh, our relationship to the world in the context of religious thought mm -hmm. uh, is very bracing because it's often seemed to me that that was a place where there were real obstacles. Well, it's also a place where there's real hope. I mean, for instance, when Thomas Berry talked of the fact that we're now entering the Ecozoic era, they gave it a name because when mm -hmm. you're in a period of great flux, uh, you don't see where you're going to come out the other side. That's one reason for my optimism. I think that we are clearly in a period in which humanity has to examine its own thought process because, again, back to Einstein, that's, you know, we, we, you know, we, we have the same set of, of uh, thought processes which are, speaking of fossils, pretty fossilized. And, and that's what keeps driving us to make the same mistakes over and over again. So the solution to the climate crisis doesn't lie in better technology or new inventions, we have everything we need. Our problem is that we're, we're quite um, fossilized and ossified in our thinking to believe that there's only one way to do things. Once we change our mode of thinking, we're in a, a very different place where we can say, well, gee, that's so much better. We, you know, the air is cleaner. Our cities are more livable. We're not facing so many carcinogens coming out of tailpipes. Why didn't we do this sooner? So the, the thought process changing is both in terms of how we relate to each other. I think we need to have a culture of nonviolence and peace. Well, we can't get there if all our thinking about security is we're only safe when we have you know, huge stockpiles of weapons. Huge stockpiles of weapons inherently make us more unsafe. So this is a real revolution in thinking. I think a lot of the leadership may in fact come from not from a church or a dogma, but from the spreading of ideas that suggest that the potential for human creativity is just at its beginning. Mm -hmm. This is not end times for human capacity or creativity. We have to actually reinvent ourselves, how we relate to each other, relate to the biosphere, and we have to do it very quickly. But fortunately, once that, uh, those new modes of thought are you know, being, being absorbed like um, you know, the first, the first uh, cup of quenching water when you've been thirsty for days. This is what, what's coming along really nicely and not from politicians. It's coming from a grassroots movement. Um, it's, uh, it's Paul Hawken has his uh, most recent book that I've read is Blessed, Blessed Unrest. Yeah. And that's kind of speaking to this fact that people right around the world get it, figuring it out, want to do things differently. And uh, it may be that governments never get it in time. And something else kicks into gear. I'm, my money's on leadership coming from people at the grassroots. And if I can, I guess I see myself, if I can do it, uh, this is a big if, uh, if I can be a voice for people who see that the better world is possible and know that the only constraints we face are fossilized thinking and political structures that want to crush creativity to hang on to power, if, if we can get through that, we've got a much better world for our kids and our grandkids. If we fail, then the world for our children and grandchildren is too horrific to really contemplate. If, if, if you're a good parent, you can't contemplate it. There's a, there's a strange quality of fearfulness with which people confront that big change, it seems to me. Uh, and I don't know that it's pe people in general, it's certainly governments, and, and if it, but there's a certain sense that we've got a kind of way that we're doing it, there's a, there's a certain momentum, and, and the shift would be just too painful. And, and even though at some level we all know it's, it's a benign and positive yeah. change. There's an enormous inertia built into any system. So the, the, the fact that you know, the status quo has the advantage every time, no matter what system you're talking about. If you're involved in a parish council and you want to change the time of the service, you're going to run into inertia. <laughs> if, yes, yeah. if, if you're in a law firm and want to change your filing codes, you run in, I mean, these are my you know, life experiences. I've had different places and I always say, well, yes, human nature and inertia. So if you're going to try to convince all the economies of the world that you can actually run better once you've decided to kick the habit of fossil fuel addiction, you run into inertia. It doesn't, you know, you, we've got reams of studies. We've got tons of evidence. And what's making the difference are these, you know, these green sprouts of proof, right? So you get, mm -hmm. you get communities that say, okay, we're zero carbon now. 
we're not just going to reduce it. We've decided to go zero carbon. Um, the Clinton Foundation's funding a bunch of cities to do this, to become zero carbon cities. The more this stuff spreads, and then it, it excites the human imagination. In the same way that, that John F. Kennedy excited the, the imagination by saying we're going to put a man on the moon, I wish we had real leadership from anybody just to say, it's possible. You know what? We are going to run our societies without fossil fuels. We don't need them anymore. We're going to go to zero carbon. And so then the discussion stops being about how many percentage points can we reduce greenhouse gases and at what cost and the, the, the barriers and the resistance goes right up, right against that idea. And people start saying, you have to be politically realistic. We can't go that far that fast because blah, you know. We not only have to do it, we will do it. And it will come about because the, the resistance drops because it's so unquestionably clear that the other course is the better course. And in every way. And it excites the human imagination and it, and it ignites young people into believing they want to be part of that change. That shifts things far faster uh, once that it's what, I don't know whether to describe it as hitting tilt, but that there's some point at which the inertia falls away because the pressure and the excitement about a positive change. And it's very hard to get change in a system if you're afraid of the change. We started this conversation by, by my observing that you were a wonderful, lovely blend of outrage and optimism, and, uh, and, and actually asking whether the optimism was fraying. But I, I find it fascinating that as we get towards the end of this, I see the optimism coming back up full force. It's just yeah. a big piece of, of who you are and, and, what, and the way you see the world, the way you really think it's going to go. It will. And, you know, I, I believe uh, you know, it was um, Ingrid Betancourt who was held hostage by the FARC guerrillas. I don't know, it was never covered in the media. She was the founder of the Colombian Green Party. She's a green. And all that time held in that, in that jungle. Um, and she never gave up. But before she was captured, speech she gave at the first Global Green Congress, which I've seen since on videotape. And she knew her life was going to be in danger in what she was planning to do. So she was very emotional as she spoke. But she, but she closed her speech, you know, the future is green. It must be, and it will be. So there's a, there's a profound hope in that. There's also a commitment. It must be, so it will be. And that's, I presume, how you get past those moments of pessimism and just, and... Yeah. Uh, well, we don't have a, you know, given where we are right now as a species, um, we, we, we need to hang on to hope. Um, uh, well, oh, I was a wonderful speaker from Bryn Mawr, and I was at a conference in Dalhousie with him recently. His name will come to me because he's terrific, and he's an architect, and he does a lot of ecological design. And what he said is hope is a, is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. I mean, hope is active. Hope is muscular. Hope is not for dewy-eyed dreamers. It's, it's, it's real, and it requires work, but it's what we must have. So despair doesn't help us at all. So thank you very much. I think this has been a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate your uh, coming to do this. I'm very happy to have done it too.